we forced the opposition to show up with Assad, who is murdering them, slaughtering the people of Syria who are in any way opposed to his regime. Uh, they didn't want to be there, and I don't see anything good coming out of this meeting because he's got, Assad has got the Russians protecting him and fronting for him. So it's a talk shop that does nothing to stop the killing. Then, then why do it? Why are we doing it? We are doing it, in my view, because the president doesn't want to get involved in Syria. Now, we saw that in 2013 when he blinked over his own red line on the use of chemical weapons. Uh, we had that week at the end of the summer where Secretary Kerry gave two really good war speeches. And then at the last minute, when um, it looked as if the president was going to act, he turned around and didn't act. That sent a message to Assad, to Iran, to everybody in the Middle East, Arabs, Israelis, um, that we really couldn't be counted upon to do anything serious in Syria. We didn't do it because President Obama said no. I have no President Obama just didn't want to get involved in Syria. In Syria. So this is really, I think, something, in my view, that's going to blot his historical record five and 10 and 20 years from now. It's like Rwanda or Srebrenica. He sat there and watched 200,000 be killed and watched six million people now, a fourth of the population of Syria, homeless, displaced within the country and in the neighboring countries, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, and he did nothing. You're on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. What concern do you have for Syria's Christians? Syrian Christians uh, are suffering really in the way that uh, Iraqi Christians did in the sense that the community is um, being decimated. More and more people are fleeing. They don't see any future in Syria. They're very afraid, of course, of the jihadi groups that are now in the country, um, of the rebel groups. Some of them have tried to make peace with the Christian communities. Others have not. If you were, I think, a... Um, Christian father in Syria looking at your children and their future, you know, I think you'd want them to get out and not just now for safety, but for the future too. I think you'd be saying, go to Europe, go to America. So it's another Christian community in the Middle East that I think is going to have a, a really hard time recovering. What can we do to help them? I still think we should be backing rebels who are not linked to Al-Qaeda, who are not jihadis, I think there are many, many Syrians who want to get rid of the Assad regime and try to form a decent government, really, for the first time in the history of Syria. You know, it's a 74% Sunni country. Assad will never be able to have power in that country except through brute force. In an election, he would lose. I think we should be, even now, I mean, it's very late in the game. And frankly, I think, and I argued this in the summer of 2013 in Testimony on the Hill, we should be willing to do airstrikes at Syrian government forces, at Assad's forces, uh, to ground his helicopters, for example. I'm not talking about troops on the ground. I'm talking about cruise missiles and things like that, um, which is really what the president was apparently planning to do last summer and then turned away. I think we need to, to change the balance of power politically, psychologically, militarily, and we can still do that. And some of the rebels uh, will say that uh, Assad himself uh, helped uh, bring al-Qaeda and other jihadists into Syria. Do you I, believe that? I don't think there's much doubt about the links between the government and those forces. Look, um, throughout the Iraq war, Jihadis were flooding into Iraq to kill Americans. How did they get into Iraq? I mean, there's a lot of borders, Saudi border, Kuwaiti border, Turkish border. That's not how they get into Iraq. They flew to the Damascus International Airport where Syrian government people escorted them into Iraq. That was the way they got into Iraq, Syria. Uh, so those ties go back, you know, 10 years now. Assad has never been afraid of or reluctant to have a relationship with those jihadi groups. Should the U.S. provide more support for the Syrian Kurds? Because they have been fighting al-Qaeda and others. 
I do think so, and I think this is reminiscent, of course, of the situation across the border in Iraq, where you have a kind of autonomous Kurdish zone, which is doing very well. I mean, they're pro-American. Their economy is terrific. They have something of a free market economy. People who go to Kurdistan will tell you, you know, you think you're in Europe. It's wonderful. On the Syrian side, of course, they've been repressed by the Assad regime forever. And now, as you say, they have a bit of autonomy. And they need those military forces to protect themselves from the strife in the rest of the country and from attacks by jihadis and from attacks by the government of Syria. I hope that our intelligence services are in touch with them, and I think we should be willing to help those groups. You know, the, the medium-term uh, outcome in Syria may well be a kind of um, establishment of zones, a Shia zone, Sunni zone, perhaps a Sunni jihadi zone, and of course a Kurdish zone in the north. Um, I a, don't ba think a balkanization of the country. It is a balkanization of the country. Uh, I don't think it'll be a de jure legal separation with different countries being set up, but the zones are there, just as in Iraq. Now, you, you had talked about this president's failed policy on, on Syria. What are the long term? I mean, you talked about his his legacy and what effect it will have. What about the long-term consequences for U.S. foreign policy? We are already seeing terrible consequences um, from the president's policy in Syria. Uh, for one thing, the uh, Arabs, uh, particularly the Gulf Arabs, Egyptians, and the Israelis, um, see us as a kind of fading power in the region, as people who aren't willing to project power. Uh, I've had Arab and Israeli officials say to me, you know, you Americans basically ran the Middle East from World War II to now. But it looks as if you're willing to see the Iranians become the dominant power in the region. Are you really willing to see that? When you see the uh, Israelis worried about making a peace agreement with Palestinians because the security situation in the region is so troubling, that's what they're worried about. When you see Gulf Arabs, Saudis, Kuwaitis, Emiratis, um, worry about American power in the face of Iran and worry not just about the Iranian nuclear program, they worry about Iranian subversion, they worry about Iranian support for terrorism. Uh, it all really comes back to Syria and the failure of the United States to, to do anything in the face of this terrible civil war. It seems there's been a shift in U.S. foreign policy away from supporting the Sunni rebels and towards supporting the Shiites, the Alawites, and even Iran. What do you think? I think fundamentally the president wants to <clears throat> stay out of conflict in the Middle East. Uh, we saw this in Libya, where the United States was led in. Remember, this was leading from behind. We didn't want to get involved. Uh, Europe led the way. We got involved very briefly. In Mali, where the French were fighting an al-Qaeda-related group, again, President, they took the lead. President didn't want to get involved. I think it's partly, you know, a sense that the American people are war-weary and really reluctant to get involved again in the Middle East. But I'd say two things about that. First, leadership. American people didn't want to get involved when Bill Clinton in involved us in the Balkans, rightly. He had something like 5% support in the polls. He did show leadership in that case. And the American people then said, you know, this was the right thing to do. So there's a lack of leadership. The other thing I think is the president's really a guy who believes that projecting American power around the world is not a good idea. I mean, this goes back to his lifelong convictions. This goes back to, you know, let's say it, to Jeremiah Wright and Rashid Khalidi and the president's old views what in the Democratic Party used to be called McGovernism. That is, that America, American power is dangerous. American power is something that needs to be restrained. Uh, and I think the president still largely believes that. Okay, in light of that, you've got uh, an agreement that moves us right into Iran, discussion on Iran. Uh, we have this nuclear agreement that took effect on Monday. And what do you think of it? I'm not a fan of this uh, new nuclear agreement. Uh, I, I think it lets the Iranians continue to move toward a nuclear weapon. You know, first of all, there's three legs for a nuclear weapon. There's, there's the enrichment, the centrifuges and all of that. There's missiles and there's a warhead. 
This agreement says nothing about stopping them from developing a warhead, and it says nothing about stopping them from developing their missiles. It just focuses on enrichment. And everybody says, no, no, it's a real good agreement, you see, because they're going to turn their 20% enriched uranium into other forms. They're going to convert it into oxide or other forms that are not useful uh, for weaponry. If you look a little further, you see that they've promised to convert it as soon as they have the capability to do that. A, a, a kind of a factory or plant that can do that conversion. They don't have it now. Now, are they going to set it up in February? They're going to set it up in March? They're going to set it up in April? Who knows? At the end of six months, it may be that they've found unfortunate delays. And that means that they will not have converted any or much of that 20% uranium. They may be that much closer to a weapon. Now, the IAEA has uh, talked about the military uses, the military program the Iranians have, this warhead program, and asked for information. Under this agreement, we don't talk about their access to military sites and about the warhead. I just, uh, you know, it seems to me that, that the Iranians don't pay much for this agreement and they're going to get a huge benefit. The sanctions are being eroded. In previous years, we always had the sense, more sanctions, ratcheting up, tougher sanctions. We've turned a corner here. And the sanctions for the first time are starting to be lifted. And you see in the newspapers every day, businessmen from all over, India, France, Germany, Italy, are rushing to Tehran to do new deals because they think this will never be turned around. We climbed up the hill, now we're starting to climb down. It seems like a reversal of 30 years of U.S. foreign policy on Iran, is it? It is, and you know, that would be fine if we had a, a good, tough nuclear agreement, which is what we all want. They really stopped their nuclear program, we stopped the sanctions. I don't think they've stopped their nuclear program. They're stalling. The Iranians have had a wonderful policy. You've got to give them credit, you know. Uh, they've been solid on this. They have crept forward slowly and steadily for decades, uh, slowing themselves down whenever they thought they needed to after the American invasion of Iraq. They've never done anything uh, that would so alarm the West, the Americans, the Israelis, that there'd be any kind of military attack. Slow and steady wins the race has been the way they've been approaching this. I think they may slow down now a little bit, but they're still moving forward toward nuclear weapons capability. So do you think this president doesn't care about Iran developing a nuclear weapon? I think he sees a problem with a nuclear Iran between, between now and the end of his term. I mean, he's made so many speeches about how you, you know, they can't do that, we won't let them do that, um, that I think would create a huge problem for him if one day, say, they test a nuclear device. I think he wants to kick the can down the road three more years until he's not president. Well, he had a red line on Syria, and he didn't do anything about that. I think the red line on Iran is tougher. You know, the red line on Syria, he said it once off the cuff in a Q&A interview. Um, I think he probably regretted saying it. This is different. He's on the record here 25 times, including during his visit to Israel. I will not permit. In the beginning, he said, they will not be permitted. Passive voice. Then he got active voice. I will not permit. So I think he can't actually permit it. So if the Iranians are headed that way and you can't permit it, what do you do? Try to slow it down. Try to keep them from doing it over the next three years. Probably take them a year or two anyway. And I think he would also like to stop the Israelis from doing anything. Now, I, I, I would ask the question, of course, what happens if the Iranians are about to do it? Would he change his view of an Israeli strike? And I think the answer may be yes under those circumstances. Because clearly, he doesn't want them to get a nuclear weapon, and he doesn't want an American military attack on Iran. So his only option, if the Iranians are right on the verge of it, is Israel. So he wouldn't stand in the way? Well, I think he would today. But if we ever get to that point, uh, I think he wouldn't stand in the way. Finally, are we getting to that point? Is it close? Well, you know, it's funny. I, um, I remember having been in the government in the Bush years that Iran always seemed to be two years from a bomb. Yeah. 2001, two years. 2005, two years. 
It's not two years now. Most experts would tell you it's more like 12 months. Uh, of course, it depends partly on how fast or slow they move forward, how bold they feel. Uh, many people think it's possible in 2014. Um, we may push them back to 2015. There's all this sabotage that, that various governments are trying that seems to slow them down too. But, you know, they're closer every year, and they're certainly closer in 2014 than they've ever been.